but thou. Make it personal. Make this personal. God just doesn't want to talk to you about your finances tonight. God doesn't want to just talk to you about getting sin out of your life. There's an improvement we can all make when we get in a relationship with Jesus. But thou, think of me. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, I, I could take off right there. But I got a lot to get to, and I want to finish tonight. So, But when you pray, and I'm hearing this around here. And I get you're young, you're new, but listen to what he's saying. Use not vain repetitions. I covered this last week. I'm not going to cover it tonight. As the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Can I tell you, you don't always have to be making a lot of noise in prayer. You do realize in a conversation sometimes, and forgive me, you need to shut up and listen. You ever told me, well, they wouldn't let me get a word in edgewise. Oh, don't let that be with God. There's a time you can get down on your face and pray and go through the format and just listen. See, a lot of people think that, man, preachers sit around a lot. No, we don't. Our bodies may be sitting, but I promise you, you can't keep up with our minds. You can't keep up with our spirits and our hearts. I was uh, doing something the other day, and Sister Crow looked at me. Are you working on a message? Are you praying? Because I was working, but my mouth was moving. I wasn't talking to nobody. Kind of reminds me of, eh, Eric has had to witness it too. It's kind of ridiculous. It is, but if I'm in conversation with somebody, you may not see him. But he sees me and he hears me and I get to hear him. Get a prayer life. Listen. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After, before you ask him. That doesn't say, well, he knows why I ask. No, he said he knows before you ask him. Ask him. Are you, did, you, did you get that? What kind of parent doesn't know you need to eat? But do you go in there and say, I want mac and cheese? I want applesauce. Can I, can I get one of those bo apple boxes? Or if you're a grown kid like me, we got ribeyes tonight? Or are we going to just have an omelet? I mean, come on. All right. <sighs> After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Listen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'm going to touch on that again. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. As it is in heaven, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen, everything is God word. Now, we don't do that. We get down to pray, oh, God, I need you. Well, well, you skip some things, pal. You ever run in the house? Don't even say, hi, mom. Come on, kids. I got it. And run and start demanding, wait a minute. Can you, can you at least say hello? We come in and we instantly make demands of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We need you. Help us learn to pray. Help us learn how to talk to you. You're hallowed. You're holy. You're majestic. You're powerful. You're almighty. Help us, Lord, with an impartation of, and a revelation of your truth. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. You can be seated. I apologize. Take the time. Take the time to talk with the Lord. He's not some far off stranger that wants to beat on you, even if you've messed up. We knew Cain messed up, but the Lord said, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? But if you don't, sin lies at the door. You can ask a mess. I'll get into that in a minute. Then he says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. we got to get to the point in our life when I walk with God that his will, not our will. 
not God align yourself to what I'm doing because I'm going to do this anyway. As a pastor, one of the most frustrating things it is is when people don't realize you got to catch the vision of the pastor. True. Yeah, yeah. I want to. I want to do it this. I get that. But you might be missing what God's already given the man of God. Cora had, and Cora was an anointed speaker. He taught, but he got out of alignment. Don't be that guy. Don't be that person. Stay in your lane. God has order. Make sense? So you got to learn to say, thy will be done in earth, in me, in this church, in my home. You don't think God gets his will in heaven? Look what happened to that joker he had to kick out. All right. Then he gets into us. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Did you catch that? You're going to have to be delivered. Some of y'all don't realize, and it's pretty harsh, and I'm not going to get into that tonight, but you'll be surprised how something so simple, because God is so holy, that we do evil stuff. Thoughts. Just oppositions. David built a cart that seemed like made so much sense, but it was so evil it cost a life. Get on, get on board to what God's doing here. Make sense? And listen to this. For thine is the kingdom. What a beautiful doxology and ending here. And the power and the glory forever. Amen. The only things I'm going to cover are the three God-centered petitions. You'll see them. I covered them. They're the, the your statements. You ready? Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. This is imperative. This is important because you have to get in alignment with what God is doing. We, the reason we ask amiss is because we're not in alignment with what God is doing. Maybe not necessarily just only in our lives, but we may be misaligning in the church, in the Sunday school, in the youth department, in, any, in, in our finances. If, if, if you want God to be intimately involved in what you're doing, then you have to be honest and say, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. And so God-oriented, these, these God-oriented requests are then followed by the three us petitions. Okay? These are the us statements. Give us this day our daily bread. You see, I've got God in alignment. Now I can ask. Forgive us our debts and do not lead us into temptation. And it ends with that amazing statement that I just read to you. What you should notice first is the overall structure because most of us focus on us. We don't take the time to honor God. We don't take the time to put God in the proper perspective in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. In fact, I believe it's safe in speaking for most of us when I say that most of our prayers are self-centered. A lot of times we ask God to move because we don't want to. But Jesus is demonstrating that God is to have preeminence. It begins by addressing God first, who by virtue of being in heaven is above all, right? And then ends by declaring the absolute sovereignty of God. 1 Peter 1.16 declares to us, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's his holiness. We can't take and say, well, I think this is holy enough. Because holiness isn't just a dress code, it's an attitude. It's a, it's a manner of thinking. He says, I know your heart. Oh, Lord, help me. You can walk around with long sleeves and be pious and think you're all that in a bag of chips and God ain't going to want nothing to do with you because you, you're, you're nasty on the inside. You can't be all 
outward holiness and inward, ain't no one can work with you, no one can get along with you, you know, you don't like people. I mean, come on. It, it's hard to have a burden for people when you start separating between who you like and who you don't like. Especially when we're told not to do that, but we're to love our Wow. Some of us, some of us are backslid. Are you hearing what I mean? What I'm saying? Hallowed. Hallowed and holy. It's, it's to, it's, it's, to be holy means to be purified or to consecrate. That's it. That is a purposeful, I'm setting this aside. How many of you ladies ever had special dishes that you set aside for certain things? And you brought them out. They're consecrated. How many got some of those guys? I remember my dad, my dad had his going out shirt when mom and dad went out to eat. I remember growing up, you have to understand, I remember them, what they called them leisure suits and them, them pants and that, and he had that shirt. And every time, oh, mom and dad, they're going out tonight. I had this little kid I recognized. It was a consecrated shirt because he used it only for that. Well, we ought to be that way. I'm separated unto I want to be holy. I want to separate myself in, 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 in the translation. It says from profane things. But you just can't be separated from. You have to be dedicated to. And that goes for us. Well, I don't do anything wrong. Okay, kindergarten, step one. But to graduate, I'm going to do what's right. Does that make sense? That's why people are incarcerated. We can tell them they're wrong. They can know they're wrong, but they ain't going to change and do right. Some of us are prisoners because of our own ways, and God can't use us because we're not willing to just be separated unto him. You're not willing to do what he's asked you to do. Does this make sense? All right. Greek, Greek scholars say that the word hallowed has, by its very implication, two subjects. I covered this a little bit. It's coming to some, I made up a word here, bi, it's a bi-directional word because it, de, it denotes our station and God's majesty. He's hallowed. He's hallowed. He's holy. I'm not, but I recognize he is. It, 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 this word involves both of us. Amen. A true believer, we know. See, a lot of people, okay, I ain't going to mess with God. I'm not going to. Okay, you know he's hallowed. But to acknowledge that means I'm going to change. I'm going to respond to that. I'm not going to straddle the fence. See, we can say I want to walk humbly and softly before God because I don't really want to do anything. Well, then you just, you've, 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 you've locked yourself away because if he's that holy, you want to do something. to. Because the, the reference is hallowed be thy name. How do people know he's hallowed if you're not doing something for him? We don't want to, if he's hallowed, do you really want, listen, you don't want to offer inferior offerings. You don't want to do like Ananias and Sapphira. You, there got to be, say, he's so hallowed, I'm not worried about what anybody thinks. I'm going to give God my best. I'm not about to give all I got to this world and turn around and throw God in fear. He's hallowed. Are you hearing me? Hallowed means I'm not going to serve anything else. Everything else is inferior. He's God, and I'm only here to worship God. Amen? That's the us part. We know he's hallowed. Our part is to make sure we acknowledge that in our life and living holy because he's hallowed. Make sense? Amen. The knowing part means we sanctify ourselves. We sanctify him in our hearts. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, listen, listen. Love your wives. Isn't that kind of strange? That's got to be put in there. You married her, didn't you? Even as Christ also loved the church. What did he do? Oh, he just sat back and, I love you. I love you, God. You know what we do? He gave himself. See, see you say you love God, but if you don't give yourself, 
if you don't give of yourself. Is this making sense? I'm not. I'm, I'm talking about your time, your resources, your energy. Because when you serve something, you serve it. Sadly, especially in today's mentality and paradigm, we serve self. We've become our own gods. Oh, I, I, I may just run off on this tangent. Okay, get the confusion that's going on in the world today. Years ago, it's okay for women to dress like men. It was easier to get that to happen than to get guys to dress like women. But we're there now. We're there now. What is that? What is that saying? What is that saying spiritually? I don't need a husband. And he don't need a bride. Denying the very essence of God. Denying, are, are, you, are you with me here? You need to catch some of this stuff. Don't, don't worry about all the political stuff. Worry about the God ramifications here of what's happening inside. Some of you are, I don't need nothing from God. Ooh. You don't need to pray. You don't need to repent. You, you, you're not putting him in his proper place. How many men walk around, bless God, I'm the man of this house. He's going to be done while you can. And then you'll turn around and say, God, I'll, I'll talk to him when I need to. I'll never forget, a, I met the niece of a very famous country singer. I was Reba McIntyre's niece. I remember reading an article. They, believe it or not, they're in church and all that kind of stuff. I was in, invited to go on vacation and all that, but I wasn't, I, I wasn't into all that. Reba McIntyre said, God knows who I am. I'll fit him into my schedule when I can. Wait, don't, don't be all hard on Reba. How many of us do that? I'm not trying, I'm not throwing her under the bus. I'm trying to say, let's make sure we're not in there with her. Or right, you hear what I'm saying? Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That he might sanctify it. If it wasn't for the Lord doing what he did, we couldn't be doing this. And cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. You need to hear this word tonight. You need to hear the preaching of the word. You, you, you can't be an island under yourself. A husband and a wife can't be living in separate lives. They, they need to work together. They need each other for the different things that they bring to the table. You want to know how to serve God? The church is the bride. Now, some of you guys may not like this, but you want to find out how a bride acts? Go read Proverbs 31. Apply that. If his name's going to be praised in the gates, how does that happen? We often look, oh, well, give me a Proverbs 31 wife. Well, I'll tell you what, that'll start with a Proverbs 31 church. Serving, working. Those people that are come and sit in my seat only, they've missed it. That's what, Those are people God said, I, I never knew you. You drew not in your lips, but your heart's far from me. When you knew love, you do. Right? What is a man that don't take care of his own family? Worse than an infidel. Hello? God takes care of us. What do you call a bride that don't show up to take care of the house? Not my job. Ooh. Are you hearing me? Let me say this. Let me this. The bride also does what? Bears children. We're the, we're the soul winners. And not only do we win souls, but when we win fruit, we're still training them up. You want to bear fruit? Bear children. We're the bride. Who have you birthed? Who are you teaching Bible studies to? Because if he's hallowed, you get in prayer, you're going to realize, I'm the bride. I need, I, need, I need to birth ministry here. I don't want to be barren. Are we hearing what I'm saying? God will make his name holy in all the earth. And when we rightfully honor him in everything, we as his children, when we live holy and by our association with him, will contribute to the hallowing of his name. How does anybody ever really hear about really living for God today? Word of mouth. Somebody saying, oh, I'm going to believe God. How do, you, how do you hear about the tenets of God? You get around someone who's doing it. We have a mandate to live holy and separate from the world. Now, we have a whole bunch of churches on every corner. And I heard a story today. Well, I'm going to give it to you. 
Man got all sideways with a pastor friend of mine. Got all bad, and oh, was, there was tension building up in the church, and then and one day he calls the pastor. He's talking to him on the front row, and the pastor knew, I'm not going to go to the office with you. So he said, I want to talk to you, and the man got mad, said, oh, the Lord told me, he wants me to teach this lesson to the church. And I said, well, okay, you're going to teach it on Thursday nights? No, I'm teaching on Wednesday nights. He says, no, I teach on Wednesday nights. This is the pastor talking to a man in the church. And then, well, then if I can't teach on Wednesday nights, then I guess I need to teach the whole church on Sunday mornings. And he said, no. And the man got mad, threw his keys down. See, you're trying to stop my ministry. And he said, no, you're trying to take a pulpit God gave me. Okay, so the man got upset, and he left. And then he starts bragging to everybody. Man, we go to church now, they accept everybody. Oh, yeah, we all, oh, man, they love everybody. You come there, you don't, it, it's one, all this and that. And then about six months down the road, this church decided they're going to go ahead and openly vote in gay marriage. And that man jumped up, and I guess he got in the middle of the, the, the politics of that church. Too. And, so, and all of a sudden, uh, he got up sideways to that church and, and, and ran into the pastor, and he's telling the church, well, I thought that church loved everybody. Careful when you start wanting to go to church that doesn't have standards. Be careful when there's no rules to be on the pulpit and the platform. Because I'll tell you, guys, you ain't here for prayer, you ain't preaching. How, how, how I got to have the base minimal standard? I don't care. Nobody's grandfathered into that one. Can I? Well, I, oh, okay. No, you, 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 I, I've been around 20 years. I don't need to pray no more. Are you kidding me? So you have to be careful when you start liking certain things or thinking that's too much. Hold on. Because this whole thing started going downhill incrementally. Now it's in our face. We need to be people of prayer. We need to be people that can get a hold of God. We need to be people that know he's talking to us and working with us. You have to say, you need to be anointed. You need to be on fire for God. And if you're going to be anointed, you need to be willing for God to adjust you. We got a chiropractor. We got a doctor in the house. All you have to do is get out of bed. You can get misaligned. You got a headache. Oh, it might be a misalignment. You got an unlikely. Let me tell you, that's spiritual too. Some of you, you got a problem with the church. You hate the church. You don't like this person. Like that. You don't want to do anything. You, you're misaligned. You're spiritually, your, your back is a wreck. You need a spiritual call to come into your life, stretch you out, and fix you. Hallowed be your name. My God, how can I walk around in the hallowed presence of God demanding and upset and bitter and angry and, well, I like you, but I don't like you. Well, I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that. You ever notice how the prodigal came back? I'll do anything. Some of us have forgotten what it's like to be in the good graces of God. I'll do anything. Wherefore, 2 Corinthians 6, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. Remember, Abba, Daddy? And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Understand, the world may be have handed you a whole lot of stuff, and you got it made, but if you're not like with God, Eternity's going to be bad. In other words, God's holiness or holiness is not just something God does for himself. It's something that we're an active participant in. I live this way, and I act this way, and I talk this way, and my attitude's a certain way, and I do this because he's hallowed. That's, what, that's a part of prayer. Matthew 5 and 16 tells us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, that's not doing stuff so people notice you. That's doing stuff so people notice him. That, that's, that's a lost tenant today. That's why whatsoever you do in word or deed, whatsoever you do, you do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, John 12. And if I be lifted up from the earth, We'll draw all men into me. We don't lift ourselves up. We lift him up. So in, in uh, um, verse 10, your kingdom come. You ready for this one? 
your will, not my will. God, you bring your will to pass, and I want to be involved in bringing your will to pass. You, you have to be, God, what it is you want me to do. Let me, let me tell you something. This separates the sheep from the goats right here. You have to understand. I'll tell you, I'm, I don't know how God does it, but my, he got that, that bit in my mouth, and he had to yank me around a few times for me to get it. Get, under, understand, so it's better to yield to God. It's just, he loves you. He's got more for you. It's better, but if you're going to be a rebellious, spirited person, it's just going to be ugly for you. You're not going to be happy anywhere. Are you here? You definitely won't be productive in the house of God. Have your way, God. Let me do my part to bring it to fruition. You hear that? Let me do my part. You can go buy all the instruments and all the things for your children because you're just a great dad, but if they don't ever do their part to learn them, it did no good. God can give you all the blessings in the world, but if you don't turn around and give it to God, well, there you go. That second prayer or the second God-oriented is concerned with the coming of the kingdom of God. Listen, in, in one sense, the kingdom has already come. Listen to me now. How many's got an opportunity to live for God right now? How many's got the Holy Ghost? How, how many's got his word? So I'm thankful. I'm thankful I got the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for that. Amen. Greatest thing I ever received. But in another sense, it's yet to fully come. We have the earnest of our inheritance, but it's not all done yet, folks. This petition is connected to the first. This statement is, and God's name is revered now through the church. You're born into, into the church by salvation in Jesus' name. You're born into this. Everybody say, I'm born into this. So when you're born into this, this is your family. This is priority. Y'all get to this in a minute. Jesus covers this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Reiterating that, God, your kingdom is first in my life. Because it says in Mark 12, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. You can't leave anything out. He's first. You hear me? And the second is like this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The church represents God's kingdom on earth. Right? So we have the kingdom of God, but not fully, because there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord Philippians 2, 10, and 11. On that day, the kingdom will be fully come. I, I just, I'm not waiting for everybody else to catch it. I'm going to bow my knee right now. I, I, see, I, see, I, see, I may have to live in a house here. I may have to some things, but that's not a kingdom. Now, I know some of y'all's comes a kingdom, but that's not a kingdom. It's just my house. And if he wants me in a different, I'll be in a different one. If he wants me to be destitute, I'll be destitute. And however that is. But like we say, we're going to live modestly to give radically because it's about his kingdom and not about steep growth. That's just the difference between those that are going to be anointed and those that are going to be anointed and used. So therefore, this petition both for the future day to come and for the present manifestation of the kingdom to be amplified in the earth, the church should arise to glorify. I've, I've come to glorify him tonight. I hope somehow, some way, that whatever I, uh, well, some of the things I got to do tomorrow, I will be able to glorify God to where somebody asks me. Nothing greater than when someone asks you about church. Nothing greater, and you know, hanging around these guys that, the, I kind of was hard on Elder Frank yesterday because he blurted out a dumb statement. And I got, you got two married men standing there and a single guy. And I looked at him and said, Frank, he shouldn't have said that. Here you are at a church. And I wrote him a little bit. We got to be careful what flippantly comes out of our mouth. And when God is not hallowed, you'll say the dumbest stuff. The sad thing is saying, it's sad to say something dumb out there. 
but it's really sad to say it in here. Anybody ever? My dad had to say something to me often. I had a, I had, I didn't have it easy like you. I had a hard road to tell. My dad taught me this thing real early because I just had a bad habit of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, and it was made me look dumb. Son, it's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. No, I I know ain't no one ever said that to you before, but I've had to have it said to me. Well, maybe some of you have had to say it. Look at some long faces in here right now. I want to glorify God. I don't want to be a fool and an idiot. Here I am, I got the Holy Ghost, and I run around acting like God doesn't exist. Acting like, oh, he's just my sidekick. How hallowed is that? In your, see, sometimes we think we've made it because the world says we have. I'm going to tell you when you made it, when, when God says you have. Hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. Right? Let the bride arise and be holy, committed, and holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, committed to God. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon me. This is your moment. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness to people, but the Lord shall arise upon me. How many is glad God didn't leave you in darkness? How many is glad right now that you know the truth? Listen, listen, I, I will give you an out right now. Look, we're just going to handle this like regular, like regular folks. Don't say your name. Don't say that. We all done dumb stuff. But you know what? Why don't we go ahead and stand right now? Thank you for that light. I do so. The smartest thing I ever did was hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. You're holy. I need to quit thinking my holiness is something. And I need to get back to that place. God, you're holy. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your, your mercy endureth forever. You're great and greatly to be praised. Anything that's happened in my life was first because you're God, was first because you're holy, was first because you're hallowed. Do you hear that? Do you realize that? Do you understand that? We get silent. Oh, it's making me stand and worship God. Right. What? I'm You've lost the hallowedness of God. I've been around some of you a little while. Some of you, not much at all. And how we treat people, and we get around. We want people to know. I want them to know they know me. And you come in the house of God and you act like you don't know him. You be seated. Understand. It says, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light. That's us, folks. And kings to the brightness of thy rising. We have to lift him up. When we lift him up, when he gets lifted up, when, when we exalt him, he becomes hallowed to people who don't even know. See, your holiness isn't for you. It protects you, but it's for God. The minute you start, you have a holiness standard different than someone else that maybe not lived a dot as long as you, and you get some pious attitude that you're better than them, now your holiness just got stomped all over by your human pride. And now God will resist you. Can I, can I tell you? Can, can we be honest? His kingdom is ever increasing. The true disciples will recognize their role in his kingdom. A believer, when you pray over our own life, when we pray, thy kingdom come. It's not self-deprecating. It's positional. Not my will, but thy will be done. We struggle. You ever, you ever been around someone? That are just, we had, like we said, we just had something happen. And for the last couple of days, we've had to deal with people literally angry and cursing God. Because if you don't know that God is sovereign, and I don't, you know, I, I've heard some of the people been living for God. I've been around this thing a long time. Been to a lot of church. Been a lot, heard people question God when they go through something. And it's really, they missed the class. I don't want you to miss class. God's sovereign. 
And can I tell you something? He don't have to make sense to you. Because if he did, he wouldn't be God. And let me help some of you. Get over your bad self. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Get to that place. Hallowed be thy name. Thou, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And that even stands for my life. When he took, when he took my health from me, I'm going to live the rest of my life and not have the health I could have had. I'm not mad at God. How do I know that that's not the very thing that kept me? You don't know. You better get over yourself. Really quick. The very thing your flesh don't want to do when it comes to God, I tell you what, I would, I would run and do it just to make sure my flesh won't lie me. I'm going to bring it under subjection. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm going to give what my flesh don't want to give. and I'm going to say what I don't want to say. and I'm going to do what's fighting me. I'm going to go all in with God. Some people don't know what all in with God is. They think going all in is God doing what they want them to, him to do. But it's not my will, but thy will. Not my kingdom, but thy kingdom. These, these can't be empty words. It must be followed by a daily sacrifice and service. You see, when it is, then there'll be fruit born. If there's no fruit, you're not bearing children. Make sense? Biblical scholars say that in a, in a, that in a very important sense, all three of the your petitions that we covered are linked together by the desire for the kingdom to come. You see, if you say, how many want Jesus to come? I got stipulations. Sister, I got, I got stipulations. I don't want him to come till I'm ready. And I don't mean ready by wanting him. I'm ready. By, I'll make sure, God, make sure you come when I'm right with you. Come the week I'm praying and fasting. <laughs> come the week when we've had a week's revival and I've been in church every day. Come, come. You realize all the exterior things we rely on to be right with God? See, prayer is an internal thing. So now we understand the value of prayer. I still have the stipulations. Look, there are just, there's just days coming. The, the, the ceiling feels like brass. My phone starts blowing up at 4 o'clock in the morning. He's calling. Contractors are calling. Saints are calling. Family's calling. And I, if I want a moment with God, i got to turn everything off and walk away. And get that time. Let me tell you something you need to do. If you got a bunch of stuff that encumbers the ground of your life, spiritually, physically, at some point you got to turn around and say, ah, oh, I'm putting God in the right place. I got busy, couldn't get to it. That's not going to be a good answer when you stand before God. Hallowed be thy name. Are you hearing me? Often our prayers are not set on fire because of a passion for God's will to be done doesn't grace our mindset. Passionless prayers are relationshipless prayers. The reason some people just are dispassionate about prayer, they're not in a relationship. Let it be you walk in here and you got a love on a death's door. You'll call me, let's pray. You'll be in the altar praying. Tragedy hits your life. Why? I need him. Do we need him less when we don't have tragedy? <laughs> well, I'm just teaching it out. I'm not trying to preach. Can I tell you, can I give you a key? You will not struggle in prayer when God is, when God's will is your focus. You won't struggle to find something to pray for. Yes, prayer time is attractive to those that are intimate with God. You know, when we were putting this building together, it fell on the, our anniversary. And I wasn't going to miss my anniversary. Brothers, it ain't just a date on a calendar. Slap your head and you better do something. So I, I went, and there's some rafters and... and Dirt and insulation, concrete floor. But you have to understand, we're all in here. It's not just a pastime we come running to at the last minute. 
of the church. We're all in. We had a table set up. I set up a table over here. I had music over. It's all set up and everything. And uh, I had dinner delivered and a great And my wife and I celebrated one of our anniversaries right here in the shell of a building. It's one of our best ones. When you include God in the most important things in your life, there'll never be anything greater than when you're doing something for, I don't, I don't know where people think, and I, I like vacations, and I like stuff just like the rest of you, but there is nothing greater than an intimate relationship with God in the most intimate relationships of your life. It don't good. I don't want to just get married, married in a church or get married and have vows said and bring God into it and then leave God out of the rest of the time. I want God in every little bit of it, right? There's nothing more intimate than people in a relationship with God. They're aware of God's will in the earth. They're intimately intertwined in doing the work of God. You'll find that you're doing the work of God, she's involved in you. They're intimately connected to the burden of the king. You have to ask yourself about your burden. See, Brother Corey right now, he's carrying a child, but it's a burden. When he cries, you don't get the attention to get from, from Corey that it gets from Alma. You see the out of that. Right? Intimately involved. So as his kingdom come, his will is fulfilled. In that sense, the third your petition sums up all three. Your will be done. Bottom line, that trumps anything, that trumps everything. It, 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 it's God's will for his name to be honored and his kingdom to arrive in fullness. And we, we see that prayer engages the already existing but not yet fulfilled paradigm of the church. We're not fully done, but we're fully engaged. As we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying both for God's will to be done in this present day and for the fulfillment for the Lord to arrive. I want his will to be done today, but ultimately I, I want him to come. And if I'm living for his will every day, I'm ready when he comes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Let's give the Lord a hand praise. This is the kind of prayer that his will would be fully realized in the lives of believers. And in both cases, it handles today and future tense. One scholar said of the three your requests that we're talking about, they should be understood in three ways of asking for essentially the same thing. That his name would be hallowed, that his kingdom would come, and that his will would be done. Because they are synonymous requests, because they work together and culminate together. You really can't separate them. They're a part of the whole. Like an egg, it's got the shell, it's got the white, it's got the yellow. It takes all of them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. So as he points out in that final phrase in Matthew 6 and 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Let his name be revered on earth as it is in heaven. Let his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All, both present tense and future tense. That's why we use the word amen, because it means let it be. Amen, amen. That's why people say amen. We let it be, let it be. It's, 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 it's a prayer word. Oh, let it be. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. I'm all in, God. Because when we pray correctly, when we pray this way, it reminds of us our role of I'm supposed to be involved in this thing. I'm supposed to be involved in bringing it to pass. We're not just praying for God to do for himself what only he can do. We're praying for God, for, for that God would do in our lives and through us what he ultimately will do for all creation. Help me be in alignment with you. Make sense? So when we turn to the three petitions for disciples' needs, at first glance you might think, well, I got more than three needs, God. Hello? Anybody got more than three needs? God, you've got to help me get this test. Well, I really want that guy to notice me. Oh, I need this job. I, I, I need this money. I, whatever it is. All of humanity's deepest needs are met in these three categories or requests. Daily provision, forgiveness of sins, 
and help in avoiding temptation. That really covers all of it. I like the fact that it's very important to note that these petitions are expressed in a mutual sense. This is going to indict some selfish people right here. The plural noun, us, is used rather than the singular noun, me. This is the real nature of Christianity. This is the essence of Christ. It is intended to be experienced in the community. We don't just pray for ourselves. We're praying for one another. You want to insult the rest of the church? Don't pray. Want to let the rest of the church know they don't matter? Run out of things to pray. Because we're required to pray for one another. That's why it says us and not me. I know some of you just got a little education right there, and that's good for you. Make it better late than never, right? We're, see, we're not just concerned with ourselves. We're concerned for each other. We are the body of Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sister Crow the other day busted her toe. I went through that. I know what I felt, I felt for all of You know what she did? She nurtured that thing. If you know someone's going through something in the church and it doesn't get into your bowels of mercy, how can you pray for God's will to be done when you don't even care about the body? When something's going, hey, we got work done at church and you couldn't be bothered? See, when you're intimately connected to the whole body of Christ, the whole welfare of the body of Christ matters to you, Right? What the world needs and what the church needs is more us prayers and less me prayers. And everybody said, oh, me. Now say amen. Proverbs 3.28, say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. Can't imagine what God sees. He turns around and he's provided for us and blessed us. We turn around and just hold it. You know why that happens? It's not thy will be done. It's not hallowed be thy name. I'm something and it's about me. What, did, what, what, what happened when in Genesis and the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? Well, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. I wonder how many in the spirit people crying out because you've withheld your bowels of mercy because you don't have the prayer life of thy will, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. I'm so busy doing what I got. I ain't got time for y'all right now. I ain't got time to do for, I ain't got time to be that deeply involved in the church right now. I got to think, God steps back. Oh boy, when you need, I was sure there for you. Now you're not going God sees that. We got to be kingdom minded. To be God minded, you'll be kingdom minded. You got to be church body minded. To be God minded, you're going to care about the body of Christ. And if you're going to be your brother's keeper, you got to care about the church. That's why we're born again into the church family. That, that's why your second birth is greater than your first birth. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 12. And while he talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said to him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak to thee. But he answered and said unto him, and I told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth, he stretched forth, he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Boy, that grates against us. That hurts some of us. We've been building a kingdom. And that kingdom is more important than his kingdom. So how can you pray, Thy will be done? Well, hold on a minute. This ain't priority to me. Well, that grates against us because the, we have the great American dream that's fixing to turn into an eternal nightmare. Give us this day our daily bread, verse 11. Let's move on because I know that was painful. After all that perspective praying and putting things right with God, aligning myself with the Lord, and it's then when we address our needs. When I know I've prayed and I've exalted God, and he's hallowed, and I'm, 
I've humbled myself right before God. No wonder some people, folks, if they skip right to this part and leave out all that other stuff, and they wonder why they have an anemic, spiritless walk with God. That's a lot to miss when you read the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. There's a lot there. Bread is obviously a reference to food, but in a more general sense, it's generally used term to reference to all the needs that pertain to life. Bread, water, shelter, clothing, safety. God, I need you to take care of me. It's a metaphor for all our daily needs. Some would make a provision or a division between this phrase and the next and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors, but they say that the prayer first deals with physical needs and spiritual needs, but when you look at it, scholars agree that by linking the two statements together with the and right there, the implication is that both portions deal with both realms. Because indeed, we have spiritual needs, and just as we have physical needs, and we have carnal debts just as we have spiritual debts. This is a prayer reflecting on dependence upon God. It's be, be, be very careful when you've been successful. Only God can truly meet our needs, physically and spiritually. Nothing else in this world will suffice. Don't, don't allow a full belly to think you don't need manna. Mm -hmm. Don't have a few things and think you don't need his provision. Many people, when they pray, get hung up on all the things they think they need. James makes a statement. When you remember, he's the same guy that talked about the tongue. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask and miss that ye may consume it upon your own love. Maybe God didn't let you become spiritually powerful because just like the physical things, you'll waste it all on you. Come on. Tell me you don't want to lay hands and see him healed. And tell me you don't want to see you highly used to God. Well, God tested you with the physical things first, and you kept it all to yourself. Why would I give you that? Why would I give you my kind of power when you look what you did with your power? That kind of sinks in a little bit, don't it? That kind of lets us know, hold on a minute. No flesh is going to glory. That's why you've got to get the first part of the prayer right. That way when you get to the us prayers. That's why you can be driving around in the car. You just yielded yourself to God. A gangster can get in there. Next thing you know, he's sick in the face of God because you already have. That's why you can turn around and pray and you don't have a dime to your name. And next thing you know, provision was made. You get that place to put God first, anything's possible. The devil, your flesh enemy, wants to get you so caught up in the worldly things that the godly things don't get accomplished. The impossible never happens. You, you got to, oh, I don't even know if God's God anymore. I don't even know. You get upset in the church. You get sideways. All the things of God that could be here, the reason all that struggles is because you failed to put him in the right place first. You ask him this. Oh, God, move spiritually. I can't even move you physically. You knew this need was right there, and I watched to see what you did, and you did nothing. Not my problem. Oh, wait, not my job. You had it right there by you. Oh, no, some other time. When, when, people, know, when people know I'm going to get accolades. Make sense? And sadly, prayer is just relegated to, instead of talking to the creator of the universe, you just give them a Santa Claus Christmas wish list. Do this for me, do that for me. I want this, I want this. But sadly, when you get down to prayer and you relegate it to that, you have to understand prayer is still, as simple as it is, it is deep. The Bible says we're going to be judged by every idle word, and I, I promise you prayers on that list. What you praying for? What's on your spiritual shopping list, really? Because it declares to God, whatever it is, I either rely on you or I don't rely on you. I want to rely on the Lord for all my needs. 
and if I have something that the church or, or someone, thy kingdom come, not mine. I think the most important thing to point out here is that these are they're also daily needs. If we learn anything from the man in the wilderness is that from God's point of view, tomorrow's needs are reserved for tomorrow. Matthew 6, 34, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for things or so. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. You receive today what you need for today. You have to know what's not being said here, but it's being said. Be careful what you store up. If it don't rot, it will rot you. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. He's not stuttering here. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. And here's the kicker. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. I don't know how many times I set myself up for failure with God because I just value something so much more. I was so glad I had that that it didn't matter to me if I really had a good hold of God. This is a clear statement on a heart condition that stuff brings in our spiritual life because though it may not be man, our heart can get rotten, full of worms. We don't care if we seek the face. I don't care if I get behind the pastor. Well, he's not doing it the way I like. I think, oh, and, and you get rotten. It's like that manna that got held up. Because you, you put your treasure in. Hell, oh, you're man, God moves today. I'm going to get up and pray and move tomorrow. And I'm going to get up and say, I want God's will to be done. Thy will, be, thy kingdom. Is this making sense? You, you young preachers, listen, to this, this should make a preacher out of you. You're not running, jump, and shout, but you get this, then you can run and jump and shout. Because I promise you keep this one, you won't get old and stale and wonder where you're happy in your ministry. Uh-huh. We need to get back. The church needs to get back to a daily prayer, a fresh supply of what God is giving. Some of you don't think God's a giver because you never got down to get. I ain't feel God in a dog's age. Well, you ain't got down and really submitted yourself in a dog's age. You're telling me God's withholding? Oh, he's not. The Bible says he's, his eyes go to and fro. He's been overlooking you because you're still doing your own thing. The next, I can't imagine if some of you got fired up in here. You'd be preaching next week. You might be singing next week. Well, better than that, you might actually be teaching a Bible study and winning a soul, which is way more important. If you remember, manna would go bad overnight. It was not good to eat the next day, except miraculously on the Sabbath. Only God can do that, and that's another message. It's a beautiful message. This is a prayer that recognizes that God, and with God in charge, every day is taken care of. He knows I need that. Now, right now, I get it. I, I'm not in the midst of some fiery, death-defying trial, but I have been, and I'm so thankful for that daily need. I'm so thankful for that daily care. I'm so thankful that when I would get up in prayer, it would be right there. I'm thankful today. Nothing's, nothing's torturing me. Nothing's heinous. But when I got, he's there. He knows what I need. I only have to recognize my dependence on him. It doesn't matter that I got a house. It doesn't matter that I got a car. It doesn't matter that my bills. None of that matters when I get up. He is meeting my daily need. And that daily need is I must be saved. It's not what I've got saved. I must be saved. And that's placing God first. That's serving God first. That's putting him first. That's making him hallowed. That's me living holy. And when you do that, you get access to him. Daily provision. Malachi 3. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And they're not getting fed there. Are you doing anything there? Yeah. And prove me now here with, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Isn't that beautiful? No one, no one but you can stop up the windows of heaven. No one but you can open the lines of communication to God. And forgive us our debts, verse 12. This is the second we-oriented petition. 
it focuses in terms of the matter of our debt to God. The Greek word for debt here that's used is something owed, due. Some of us brag on not owing anything, but daily you get up and owe. See, some of you miss out. You got success in the world, but you're in debt to God. It's a word that had a common metaphorical meaning that invoked the metaphor of debt as we refer to sin and the debt to God. Luke's version of the same prayer, he uses the word sin instead of debt, if you want to go read that. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. He says sins. This request shows that as a disciple of Jesus, we have obligations to God. And that when we fail to satisfy those obligations, we neglect, and one of the worst things, and I've had it say, I have no sin in my life. Oh, God. The Bible says any man that says that's a liar. It is a matter. It, it, it is a situation that needs to be resolved. And it can only be resolved through repentance. I get up every day. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. I've got to put you for thy kingdom. Come, hallowed be thy. Let me get all these things right. This demonstrates the continued need for a prayer of repentance in the life of a believer. Daily repentance is daily needed because I daily need him. We're not perfect. None of us are. I know some of you are getting really close. But we all need to daily find an altar of prayer for repentance because, yes, indeed, even though we're spirit-filled and use talking tongues every Sunday, we're inherently human. I'm human. Where do we get the idea that we've become godlike and I don't need to repent? Or that I don't need to pray, or don't need to pray, and let the Holy Spirit move through me to where I speak in tongues again because I've yielded that degree to God. Let's be honest about this. I am human. I'm not a deity. I sin. I think bad thoughts. I say bad things. I have an attitude. I get, uh, and I, I just fight like it's okay. He says it's not. Sometimes our actions, and especially our attitudes, fall so far short of the kingdom and the standards of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm the worst one here for this. I'll take that. Oh, I get an attitude. I got to bring that in. I know y'all don't believe me, but boy, I get upset sometimes. The other day, I got to upset and walked to the back. Aaron thought he was going to be killed. And he wasn't even the focus of my attention. Because, listen, I've said this before, but I don't think we take it to heart. We judge ourselves, but we judge ourselves by our, inten our intentions and not by what we really think and do. Can we be honest? Yet God sees our attitude, and he sees our actions. He sees it all. That thought, that idea, that rebelliousness, that comment, so if we have followed the plan of prayer that Jesus gave us, we've just prayed that God will be honored in everything we do. And now we recognize that unfortunately this is not always the case because though I want God to be honored, my attitude, my actions, my thoughts, some of my deeds fall woefully short. Therefore, we all have a debt to God, and we all need to be forgiven. And once again, this is an acknowledgment of the fact that the best of our righteousness falls short of his standards and his righteousness. So we continually need to, we continually need the grace and mercy of God. Can I ask a question? Is there anybody here that doesn't need it? The day you just say you don't need it is the day you don't need to pray. As we forgive our debtors, I'm going to give you one of my most important statements tonight. If you get anything, please get this. A forgiven person is a forgiving person. That's deep. You better think about that one. You got ought, 
you're not forgiven. You think about it. This is Bible. The point here is that our experience of forgiveness must result in a change of heart on our part, and it should produce a willingness to forgive those who owe us a debt. See the command, it's mutual, the mutual nature of fellowship with God. Forgiveness is not just about us. Bless God, I don't need forgiveness. Well, I ain't done anything wrong. Look at them sinner rank they did to me. Forgiveness is not just about us, it's about others. We are to forgive as we are forgiven. Remember Matthew 18, this is a principle, and, I, and, I, and I, I, in all honesty, it would behoove you to read this chapter once a month just to keep like a car alignment on your car. Align it. You can't afford the wear. The principle is illustrated in the parable of the forgiven debtor who is ultimately cast into prison after he fails to forgive those who owe him less than what he owed. That's gonna, you want to know why there's going to be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth in hell? That right there. You, 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 uh, you didn't forgive someone over less than what you owed. You got bitter over less than what you'd done. You think, you think too high of yourself. You put yourself in the place of God, and he's like, I'll be my name, not yours. My will be done, not yours. That's not going to be hard for you to handle when you're already praying that every day. Matthew 18 is the unforgiving debtor. Go read that for homework this week. 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Be a one. I got to hurry. This third, we, us, oriented petition concerns temptations that we all encounter in our walk with God on this planet, in this world that we live in. We're all different. I'm pretty sure you young teenage girls are dealing with a whole lot different than what the 60 year old man in his little red basketball outfit deals with on a daily basis. I'm pretty sure that Sister Loopy, the stuff that you deal with is a whole lot different than what I deal with. And there's, so you have to understand, we're all different here. The wonderful thing is that if we'll hallowed be thy name, thy will be done. We get there. When we get to us, we can be honest about what we're dealing with. Because what I can do in life may not be what you can do. And what you can do may not be what I can do. Are you listening? The prayer here is not that God would tempt us, for God tempts no man, but rather that God would help us to both avoid temptation and withstand temptation. See, the problem is that we don't listen to God, and we often tempt ourselves right out because, what did I say Sunday? Some people live by lawless and not by expedient. It may not be against the law to have it, but it's not expedient for you. And if you can't figure it out, that's why you never got to it. You'll hear guys all the time, especially us older guys, these young kids playing these video games. And just down them dumb video games. Well, you know what, us older folks, we got our games. And they ain't no better than those. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Be careful when you say, well, I like it. Be careful. And enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, see, we're the ones supposed to be giving birth, but now lust is giving birth. We start producing a whole bunch of stuff that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God because we're in the wrong stratosphere, so to speak. It brings forth sin, and sin when it's finished brings forth death. We all have a need of prayer no matter our social status or station. Well, if I wasn't rich, I wouldn't have to deal with this. Well, if I wasn't poor, bless God, the poor are tempted to steal, cheat, and commit. The rich are tempted to be arrogant, greedy, stingy, and prideful. They'll all get you to a bad place spiritually. It really doesn't matter what your lot in life is. And if they're not cared for through prayer, they all lead to death. Are you hearing me? Let's stay. Deliver us from evil. He's talking about the evil one. Another name for Satan. Save me from the evil one. 
Let me tell you something. That will be your only battle if you can get those first three prayers. Hallowed be thy name. Because we can be delivered here. We can be delivered right here and right now. Right now. Well, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Yours is the king. Can, can we say that? Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Like that's, that's put everything that you can, I don't care if you're Bill Gates, I don't care if you're Steve Jobs, when you die, everything here doesn't mean generally your kingdom, your power is forever. 